Hi guys! Thank you for joining me in my studio today for episode 3 of Art and Chat. For those of you who um, are first timers, basically Art and Chat is an hour-ish long video where I work on a piece of artwork in real time and answer some of your frequently asked questions. And without further ado, let's get started. Alrighty, so before we begin answering questions today, I wanted to quickly explain the piece I'm working on. Um, right now, it is just a concept sketch that I had transferred with um, transfer paper onto my gesso board. And basically, this is going to be a piece for my upcoming solo show at Future Gallery in Lake Orion, Michigan. And I'm really excited about it. Um, if you've been following me on other forms of social media or just following me on YouTube, you'll know that I have a couple of shows coming up, so it's going to be quite a busy month or two. Um, I'm trying my best to not let the stress of the impending deadlines ruin my, I guess, my momentum and my mood, but um, yeah, I'm starting to lately realize just how many pieces I have to do, and I'm just trying to get them done you know, in, in the proper speed, but also not compromise on quality. And I think, especially with oil painting, a lot of times you really do need to just like sit down and have patience and slowly carve out um, the details of your painting. So I really don't want my mindset to be that of something rushed or something anxious. So I think filming this art and chat is really good to keep myself in like almost like a calm meditative state and you know it's really nice to just sit here and talk with you guys and although it's not live um i still really enjoy it it feels live to me in a way it almost takes it's like less pressure <laughs> than an actual live stream um i know a couple of you guys have asked me about whether or not i'm gonna stream these live um or ever do something like twitch or anything like that and Although I do do live streams, I keep them special and exclusive to my patrons. Um, if you've watched the previous art and chat episodes, I'm sorry if this is a little bit redundant, but for those of you who haven't heard me explain why, um, basically I really, really value everyone's support, whether you're a patron or not. So I, in no ways am I trying to exclude or, you know, ignore anyone who's not like a paying customer i'm never that kind of person but you know the reality is if you're a full-time artist patreon is one of the main ways and for some people the only way that you can earn money and for me patreon is my main source of income so i really do want to make sure that people who do pledge to me and pay for exclusive content on patreon are not let down so i i really try to make a fair balance where I do give enough quality content for people who do not have the resources to pledge money to me and I never ever want to pressure anyone into paying for me or anything like that um, but for the people that do I really do want to show just how much I appreciate and cherish them so I do only do live streams for my patrons um, it's I think I do live streams for anyone who pays $5 or above. So it's really honestly not that much. It's $5 a whole month and you get so much exclusive content from me. I put out tutorials. I'm super active on Patreon. So um, I'm going to be drawing the questions to answer these uh, Q&A sessions from Patreon as well. They are awesome questions. They're asked by everyone. So it's not like a Patreon only type of question. Um, these are very broad, interesting art career and art related questions. So yeah, I, I always like to throw this disclaimer out there because I do know a lot of people get really mad if artists try to make money or try to I, I guess advertise the platforms in which you know a customer might have to pay for something and I think especially with YouTube um, obviously it's it's rooted in not having to pay you know YouTube is not like Netflix or anything like that it's it's supposed to be free and I do want to adhere to that spirit but at the same time again like you know you got to make a living somehow you got to be able to pay rent so I am going to be offering more exclusive things to my patrons, but it's it's not any mal intentions. I'm just simply doing it because it's it's kind of the right thing to do if you have a paying customer. Anyways, enough babbling about that. Let me tackle the first question now. 
So the first question is from Ashley Stanley, and she says, Hi, Happy. I was wondering if in the early stages of your art career, if you ever went through periods of self-doubt, and if you did, how did you deal with that? Um, yeah, not just early in my career, but even now, I think self-doubt is a very normal feeling um, for any profession. Um, in my experience, I've had self-doubt you know, when I was working in tech, when I was in school, studying, you know, engineering, and also especially as an artist. Um, in some ways I had, in some ways I have more self-doubt as an artist, um, and in other ways I have less self-doubt. And what I mean by that is, as an artist, um, I don't have doubt in the sense that like, this is the right path for me. Like I've always been confident, even when I wasn't super popular or successful, um, and when I was just starting out and I had, you know, very few followers and, and things like that, I still had the confidence that this is where I'm supposed to be. This is what I'm supposed to be doing with my life. And I think the only self-doubt that came from being an artist was just a doubt of, you know, am I going to grow fast enough? Am I, am I going to be able to make enough money to support myself? Am I going to make this a permanent career or, you know, will it ever take off? Will I... You know, even if I have moments where I feel like I've succeeded, you know, I always doubt like whether those moments are permanent or only temporary. And then when I was working in um, tech and even though I had more confidence in the sense that like I went to school for it, I had a degree. So on paper, I was qualified, so to speak, for whatever job I ended up doing. Um, I didn't have the confidence that this was what I wanted to do or that this was what I was best at. So. Yeah, in some ways, the self-doubt of being an artist and, and early in my art career was like, I guess, a, a better way of self-doubt. I don't know if self-doubt is ever good, but the self-doubt of my art career only motivated me to work harder versus the self-doubt of my other careers um, made me kind of question everything. And I think especially early on, the way I dealt with my self-doubt was just to keep moving forward um, I because honestly I didn't have any other choice like I could choose to wallow in that doubt and anxiety and let it get me down or I could choose to harness that doubt into um, almost like kicking myself in the butt or like a shot in the arm you know like using that kind of energy into something productive rather than something discouraging and I know that's like really cheesy to say and everyone gives you that advice but I think if you truly love something and it is your calling, like if it's your soulmate, you know, like your your career soulmate, um, it is fairly easy to adapt that mindset. Like never once in my mind did I think of quitting or giving up. Um, it's always been a very clear answer of like, oh, you're feeling doubt? Well, time to work harder. Or, oh, you're feeling doubt? You know, time to harness that doubt into eradicating whatever was making you feel doubtful in the first place. So. If I was feeling doubtful that my, you know, questioning my style or my painting skills, um, I would just practice more. You know, if I was feeling doubt of earning enough money, um, I would just produce more art and try harder to to make artwork that people responded to, to make artwork that I was proud to sell. And yeah, that's how I dealt with it. <laughs> Okay, the second question is from Anna, and she asks, how do you train yourself to be more creative? That's a really good one. Um, I might have to think about that. So I think a lot of the, the important components of creativity are also rooted in originality, um, meaning like you wanna create something that stems from your own imagination. You wanna tell a story that is in your voice that is unique to you. Um, obviously, when I say being original, I don't mean like you can't paint anything that's already been painted. Obviously, I paint women. I paint beautiful, weird women. I often use flowers and nature elements. So, you know, I, I'm fully aware that the themes and motifs that I enjoy painting have already been done. And um, that is not really what gets to me. Um, I'm not really afraid of that. I think. Trying to be creative is just taking those really common motifs or that common genre that you enjoy and putting your own unique twist on it. Um, 
a huge tip that helped me in becoming more creative and all and finding my voice in a sea of voices that all kind of you know are painting similar things is I try to not follow any one artist closely I know like a huge source of inspiration for me a huge source of motivation um, is to look at other art and other artists and you know find find that muse find that inspiration from looking at other artworks but if you do it too much especially if you follow one artist too closely your work ends up looking really not only looking similar to theirs but you kind of also stifle your your own voice your own creativity a lot of creativity for me happens from filling filling up empty spaces in in your mind with a picture you know or um looking at something that happened in your life and allowing that idea or that that instance in your life to kind of grow on its own organically into something else and when you pay too much attention to someone else's story, someone else's voice, um, you almost get like, I wouldn't say brainwashed, it's like really intense of a term, but you kind of confuse yourself because you're wondering if, if is this story or this idea coming from me? Like, is it growing from my own experience or is this story growing from someone else's image or someone else's story that I've seen? So while I think it's great to have um, to be influenced by your favorite artists and to obviously consume art all the time like go to art museums um go to art galleries look at art on instagram or whatever i think it's important also to take breaks and focus on your own voice and try to try to give yourself enough space and silence to listen to your voice i think um i don't mean to get like cheesy or philosophical here but there's an inner dialogue within all of us um, especially when it comes to creating ideas for artwork or, you know, maybe songs or any sort of art that you do. Um, you have to listen to that inner dialogue and at times you can cloud that, you can cloud it with too much white noise or too much um, distraction. So yeah, give yourself ample space and um, silence to, to hear what your soul has to say. <laughs> oh my gosh, <laughs> I'm becoming so philosophical here. But yeah, okay, next question. Um, next question is from Emmeline Kute. Okay, I'm really sorry if I'm pronouncing your name wrong. And she says, Hi, Happy, I love you and all your videos. Oh, thanks. And I was wondering if you have a ventilation system in place since you're in your studio so much and use so much oils. Thanks. Um, yes, I do have... I don't have like a professional ventilation system. I don't even know what that is, to be honest, but I do have um, tips, I guess, if you wanna keep your room ventilated for those of you who paint at home. Um, so aside from just keeping the windows open all the time, I have a little desk fan. Um, it's I actually initially bought it to keep myself cool during the summers, um, but also sometimes I just turn on now whenever I'm working because it helps just keep an extra bit of circulation, especially since the desk fan is right next to my palette and my easel. Um, it just is a more direct way of, I guess, keeping the fumes um, not too stagnant. And also I have a fan in the middle, so right I don't know if you can see, but behind my studio, um, there's a hallway and there's a fan in the hallway. So I always keep that fan on. I always keep my door open, except for today because I'm trying to not let my animals run around too much. But um, so yeah, that's the second thing I do. And then also another thing <laughs> that I do, I think it annoys my boyfriend. So we live together and he is a lot more cold than I am. Like I'm always wanting warm temperatures and Sorry, I'm always wanting the temperature to be colder and he's always wanting the temperature to be warmer. Um, so, but I love opening the windows at night um, when I go to sleep because it's it's like a period where you're not creating any more fumes and you're not working on anything. And also if it's cold or windy, um, for me, I don't really feel it when I'm asleep. In fact, I prefer kind of a cold environment to sleep in. Maybe that's weird, but he hates it so we often don't agree on this but whenever it's a warm night and he's not too cold um i'll keep the the windows open at night um and not just in my room but uh, the the windows open in m as many rooms as i can just to keep the entire place circulated and also um 
if if you're too cold or you live in a climate that's too cold and you can't do that i also suggest just ventilating when you're out of the house like if you guys are going out for a movie or i don't know if you're just going out for dinner um even those few hours that you're gone just keep your windows open um obviously if you're in a cold place it's gonna rack up your heating bills but that's in my opinion just kind of the price you have to pay if you have an at-home studio um, it is really important to keep things ventilated and to always you know go through several hours long um, periods and intervals of of having your windows constantly open um, and I also do recommend if you can get a little desk fan I got mine from Target it was only like 30 bucks and you know it's a great way to um, ventilate without affecting the temperature of your entire house but yeah I, I think like also I want to add um, it's not just for oils I know there's a huge stigma against oils being toxic and you know the fumes being poisonous but if you work with any sort of artwork that involves pigments so any sort of colors um, even charcoal I think like it's better safe than sorry so if you work with acrylic or watercolor or charcoals or color pencils just keep your work area ventilated um, I have read obviously every study is gonna be different everyone has their own different opinions there's there's pretty much a research study backing up every single claim you want to make but in the thing in the material I've read it's not the oil paint that is toxic it's actually the pigments that's toxic and pigments are appear in every sort of medium so acrylics have pigment you know watercolors have pigment anything that has color has pigment so keep it keep your room ventilated if you do any sort of art in that room that's my advice okay um Next question I have is from Finn Lights Lightsaver Lightsavior. I'm so sorry if I'm pronouncing your name wrong. I'm so bad at pronouncing foreign names. Um, hi, Happy. I was wondering if you could share a little bit on why. Okay, so I'm just gonna paraphrase because I think this is worded a little confusing. But basically, why do you prefer um, oils over acrylics when acrylics drying time makes finishing them so much easier? Um, so yeah, that's a great question. I actually, I, I dabbled in acrylics at some point in my life and, you know, obviously I don't do acrylics anymore. And I think it's not because, it's not because of drying time. Like my metric for measuring whether or not I loved oils was not because, um, of drying time. And, and the reason why I gave up acrylics wasn't because of drying time. I think I, I don't mind waiting for things to dry. Um, and I'm not in a rush to finish things super quickly like that. That's not my main prerogative when I'm painting. So obviously the, <laughs> the, the drying time advantage that acrylics has over oils didn't appeal to me enough for me to stay painting in, in acrylics. I don't have anything against acrylics. In fact, I remember doing the period of time when I used them, I quite enjoyed them. It's simply because I love oil so much more and it's like, you know, I can't deny that I just have way more fun with oils. Um, a huge reason is not just like, I think I've seen acrylic artworks that have blown me away that I actually thought were oil paintings because of how, how rich the colors were, how luminous everything was. So in no way am I saying that, you know, you cannot achieve the same effects in acrylics as you do in oils. I think if you're skilled enough and you um, are able to wield your medium you know appropriately you can achieve whatever you want in whatever medium you want i'm just saying personally i enjoyed oils more and i think it comes down to almost the texture of it um when i'm working with oils i feel like i'm spreading butter <laughs> on my canvas it's just so luxurious it's so smooth i actually in fact prefer the slow drying time because i don't have to remix my colors i don't have to um like I'm able to blend and layer and I feel like with acrylics you can definitely still blend and there are s mediums that you can use to slow your drying time down but no matter what like it's gonna be harder for you to blend acrylics because 
they do dry so fast and your window for dry, for blending them is so fast. So if you miss your window, um, you are kind of almost forced to just layer and use washes to achieve certain effects. And I just, for me personally, blending feels a lot more natural to me and I'm a lot better at it. So yeah, there's really no, like I guess logical reason why I gave up acrylics or I prefer oils over acrylics. It's simply personal preference and yeah, I have mad respect for people who actually a lot of my favorite artists, um, Casey, Casey Weldon or Casey Whedon, I keep forgetting which last name it is, but he's an artist from Seattle and his acrylic techniques are amazing. And, you know, there are things he like when I first saw his paintings, I thought he was an oil painter because his colors are so lush and vibrant and, you know, he's able to really wield his medium so well so i have a lot of respect for anyone who can excel at whatever medium they're using there's nothing no no beef against other mediums um i just simply am a fan of oils you know it's kind of something i couldn't even help i think also when um if you're if you're just starting out and trying different mediums i would like that's a a tip I have or I guess a recommendation I have is just to kind of like listen to your gut. Um, if you give a medium a fair try and you don't like it, then by all means do not feel pressured to pursue that medium just because someone else or another tutorial or video or art teacher or anyone tells you to. Um, for me, like the second I started trying oils um, or started really trying oils, I did, I did some oil painting, like Bob Ross oil paintings when I was in high school, but the, the second I actually tried making my own pieces with oils and instead of, instead of always following tutorials, but like trying to be creative on my own with oils, I just knew that I loved it. Like I struggled with it for sure. I made a lot of mistakes, definitely, but something inside of me was just like, this is so fun. Make another piece in oil or try harder. Um, there was never there was never a voice that told me to give up. So I just stuck with oils because it's kind of intuitively what I wanted. Okay. Whew. I'm hoping that um, <laughs> this goes well. I'm still trying to master the art of talking and painting at the same time, which is like one of the hardest things to do guys, seriously. And so I really don't want to mess up this face. Um, but yeah, okay, next question is from Marlo, and he asks, Hi Happy, when you first started sharing your art online, were you anxious of how people would react to it? How did you get over the fear that your art is not good enough to be shown publicly? Ooh, that's a really good question. Um, so when I first started sharing my art, I wasn't a full-time artist. Um, I had shared it, I think, well... First, it was on um, Facebook, and I shared it only to my, my friends who knew me in real life. So I think right off the bat, people were very supportive because they were my friends and very encouraging. And then um, when I started sharing on Instagram, I was definitely aware that there were a lot of artists out there who were better than I was, who were able to paint better. And um, so, yeah, I definitely did feel anxious because I felt like, you're you're stepping outside of your inner circle and you're stepping outside of you know the group of people that you know for sure um, care about you and want to um, you know what's it called want to want to nur nurture you and you know say nice things to, to to boost you up you're you're stepping outside that circle so anyone online could say anything they want you could you're facing the risk of someone criticizing you or making you feel bad about your art and that's a risk that everyone takes for putting themselves out there on social media whether it's you know art or music or vlogging or anything um, if you choose to share something you love or choose to share something you're passionate about with the general public you're taking a risk of being criticized and even if you don't ask for cr criticism like even if you post a piece of artwork and you don't ever ask people like what do you think or how can I improve or what should I add like if you just share something and said hey this is a piece that I recently finished I'm really proud of it people are still gonna criticize you so dealing with that risk um, initially it was a hurdle, but I, I just kind of told myself that it was worth the trade-off. Like, I'd rather share my art and have it reach people that would respond positively to it, people that it can positively influence, 
and just deal with the occasional few people that would criticize it. And um, to me, it was a worthy it was a worthy sacrifice because sharing my art on social media is what kind of started my art career. You know, when I saw that people reacted positively to it, it gave me that reassurance that there was an audience for my work and that there were people that, um, you know, who's there were there were people who um, really found their own voice in my art, you know, people who really related to it on a personal level, people who are inspired by it. So I wouldn't have known all that if I never took the leap of faith and shared my artwork to begin with. And I think like, it is, <laughs> I mean, to this day, I deal with that anxiety of, of showing my work publicly, um, even though I feel a lot more comfortable now than I used to, but you definitely get people who will criticize you and misunderstand you. And I think like, it's really hard to expose a part of yourself that's so personal, um, especially art. I think like, honestly, it's, it's, having someone criticize my work is worse than someone criticizing like a selfie I took or something, you know, like someone calling me, um, or, or sorry, not calling me names. No one's ever called me names, thank God. But someone like criticizing the way I look or the way I talk or something small and almost like petty um, doesn't really get to me at all. But if someone criticizes my art, it's like my art comes from a very personal, private part of my soul. And, you know, when you put that out there and it's not well received, it's it's a lot more, it stings a lot more and it hurts a lot more than, you know, if it's something small and petty. So I do, I do put up with that anxiety and, you know, at the end of the day, you just kind of have to not focus on, on the one criticism in a sea of positive responses. I think that's something that humans tend to do, like if we get... 10 compliments and one critique, we always focus on the critique. Like that's what we lie lie awake at night thinking about. We don't think about the over, overwhelmingly positive responses we got. So just remind yourself that, you know, of all the positive things that you've heard or that you've encountered or that you felt from sharing your art, don't focus on the negative. Don't focus on the things that have never even happened. You know, that's kind of the, the philosophy of risk is it's something bad but it hasn't really happened to you yet but you fear that it will happen so don't focus on that focus on what has happened and if you're going to focus on something that hasn't happened yet why not think about the good things that haven't happened yet you know so instead of being like oh well what if my art is not good enough and people critique me or people look down on me why don't why don't why not think of well what if someone responds really well or what if I meet some cool new friends? Um, what if I start gaining a good following of people that appreciate my work? Um, you know, keep yourself in a hopeful, positive mindset. Okay. I'm trying to make this hair black, but it's really weird to do it when the face is not complete. Um, yeah, I definitely don't have like a specific logic or technique when it comes to doing the first layer of my paintings um it's just like for those of you who've been following me for a while and paid attention to my technique um you'll notice that i've actually changed a lot my in the beginning when i started paintings it was a super rough like 10 minute color blocking stage where i just wanted to fill up every inch of the canvas right away and you know i would kind of go in and layer over those rough parts later but now I'm trying to do a thing where even my first layer I want it to look presentable and I want it to not be too rough and I want it to kind of get me started on the second layer um, on the right foot so instead of spending the second and third layer trying to cover up some rough messy brush strokes I just want to spend the second and third layer really perfecting things and polishing things so the first layer I'm still trying to make it good which is <laughs> Um, you know, it's I've only done a few paintings in this technique, so it's still new to me. So I'm still trying to like uh, figure it out. But yeah, and I think right now, like, there's just too much pink on the face. I'm gonna add some more other tones, like greens and blues, just to balance it out. Okay. Next question is from Brandy Bell, and she asks, "Do you ever consider incorporating political themes into your work?" Or do you tend to steer clear of them so that people of different beliefs in your audience won't feel alienated? 
That is such a good question and so relevant to the current events, um, especially for those of us watching and participating who are living in the United States. Actually, well, any part of the world, not just the United States. So I take that back. Um, I think the entire world right now is going through a lot of political turmoil and it's hard to like sometimes I really don't want to focus on it um I have been I've been steering clear of of divulging too much into political issues because my art channel is an art channel and I don't want people coming here you know whether or not you agree with my opinion or my stance um I just want my channel to be a place of like peace and rest and inspiration and positivity I'm so hesitant to share like my anger and stuff with, with people, not because I'm afraid of people disagreeing with me, but because I just generally don't feel like it fits with my mission for this channel. Like my mission for this channel is to spread art. And although I do have a lot of feelings and anger towards what's happened in my country, um, it's not something that I, I've, all, I've ever wanted to share on my channel. That being said, like, I think it's also, um, I don't wanna lie and be irresponsible and pretend like I feel a certain way or pretend that certain injustices that are happening are okay. So um, if you follow me on Instagram or YouTube, you see that I, I definitely bring it up, but I don't, I don't dive into too much detail. Um, I kind of just try to raise awareness in the most positive and, uh, yeah, the most positive, open-minded way I can. Um, I think in terms of my art though, like, so social media presence aside and, and my posts aside, um, in terms of the actual artwork, there's nothing political about it, um, simply because I've never, that's never been my my style or my um, genre. I think like there's amazing political artists out there who do like, you know, those political cartoons that we have become so iconic in, in American culture and in, in, in the history of journalism. But also, um, yeah, a lot of artists have, like for example, Mark Ryden is, is one of my favorite artists and his stuff is at times quite political. He tackles a lot of issues with um, the government and religion and, oh. Sorry, my camera cut out for a bit, but um, yeah. So like I was saying, Mark Ryden is really good at doing that. And he's always done that since the beginning. And for my art, um, when I first started doing it, like my style and my subject matters evolve very slowly and evolve very organically. I don't try to push things. I, any direction I just kind of almost let my art and my aesthetic take take its own course you know like have its own voice and so um, I've just never been led in that direction to incorporate anything political that being said I'm not closing the door on the possibility that in the future I you know I might whether whether on purpose or subconsciously um, I think you know sorry I I'm gonna just briefly touch on this, but because again, like I don't want this channel to be politically charged and obviously I don't want to alienate, alienate anyone, but I think um, people in my generation, so people in their 20s, um, I've noticed in the past year have been a lot more politically active and, and involved than ever. So um, especially with this recent election and that entire, that energy really inspires me. Um, I've had friends, who um, I've never known to be to be politically active, who will do like protests and marches. And um, I've seen so many artists as well on social media speak up and people who like, I've never seen that side of them. And you know, whatever, whatever your prerogative is or whatever your reasoning is, it's really nice to see people at least put effort and invest time into social justice and caring about others and not just out of, out of self-interest. And I love that. And it's something that I would love to be a part of and contribute more to. So um, sorry for the long, long winded answer, but basically, yeah, my art is not political. My subjects are not political, but it's not something that I have anything against. And um, it's something, it's not something I would rule out ever happening in the future. In fact, I think a lot of people 
and I didn't ever do this on purpose, but I'm really glad that it happened. A lot of people have responded to my work saying that um, they really love the um, almost like feminist empowerment that comes from just simply painting a nude woman. Um, I, you know, as you guys know, I've been painting a lot of nude women. I don't share them on YouTube because I have heard of cases where videos get taken down and blocked, which really sucks. Um, but if you go on my Instagram or, I, or my Facebook, you'll see that I do paint a lot of nudes now more than ever. And one thing that I always try to accomplish with my nude women is I don't try to sexualize them. They're, they're nude, but they're, they're not doing it to be objectified or to be sexy. It's, it's a very, I try to make them very tasteful and timeless and elegant and um, I'm really happy that so many women have responded really well to that because I think that's that's in line with a lot of recent sentiments of, of women's rights and not, um, you know, women being viewed as equals. And I've always been a proponent of that in the art industry. So, like, for example, um, it's like what I talked about on YouTube. Like, I think it's crazy that a nude woman, a painting of a nude woman could have a chance to be blocked or taken down. Um, but, you know, a painting of a shirtless man has no problem. And on Instagram, I've been through many situations where I've had pieces removed from Instagram because they featured a nude woman. Like, not even the entire body, just the nude breasts. And, um, you know, those happen to me. They happen to a lot of my favorite artists. And they're, it's so annoying when that happens because, like... <laughs> When I paint nude women, it's it's done. I mean, I am a woman myself and it's done in the most respectful way. It's done for art, it's done for for beauty and for inspiration. It's not supposed to sexualize anyone. And the fact that someone was offended by it because they viewed it from that sexualizing point of view and had it taken down, um, it really angered me. And I think, I don't know if you guys know this, but I actually wrote a lot of letters to Instagram and um, I was able to even talk to an employee who works on the team about it and share my sentiments and I mean I don't know if if one voice has has the power to sway their policies but based on the conversation I had with the employee um, they they agreed with me they were like you know what um, if this happens to you again just email me directly um, or if you see it happening to any other artist just email me directly and so hopefully over time, things can improve both on the um, art social media front and in general in the world. But yeah, I really love that um, women are finding empowerment through my artwork. That's, that's just, I'm so humbled and so amazed by that. And I hope that's something that continues to grow and um, yeah. <laughs> okay, this face is kind of making a little more sense now. Okay, I'm gonna, oh my gosh, foreheads are so hard to paint because they're not like a perfect round shape, but they're just round enough, so I have to really pay attention here. Okay. Okay, next question is from Nikki Regoli, and she asks, since you first started using oil on wood, what are some lessons you've learned about oil painting or mistakes you've made through trial and error? Um, I'm relatively new at oil painting and keep learning from my mistakes the hard way. Well, I think if you're learning from your mistakes, whether it's the easy way or the hard way, you're already on the right track. I think with any medium, um, it's hard to get everything right on the first try. And I find great honor in making mistakes. Like, it sucks in the moment because you either have to, you know, invest a lot of kind of extraneous time in fixing your mistake, or you might have to start over if you made a terrible mistake, like I have a few times. Um, but ultimately, recognizing that you made a mistake is also um, recognizing that you've just learned something valuable for next time. So I don't ever shy away from the possibility of making mistakes, and I'll never, I'll never avoid trying something new just because I fear a mistake. In fact, when I try something new, I'm equally excited to have it succeed or to have it fail because either way I'll know. And, um, but yeah, if, if I were to say that some important lessons I've made or important lessons or mistakes, honestly, I should probably make a separate video about this because it's such a broad topic and there's so much I wanna say. But um, off the top of my head right now, I would say that like, 
with oil painting, the number one mistake I made was like not having enough patience for it or like not, not treating it or um, viewing it the way that it is. Okay, this is really confusing. But basically I was trying to make oil paint into another medium and I was trying to use it like I was using other mediums. And it's so different from other mediums that if you apply the same techniques that you use in other mediums, um, in oil painting, you're going to be disappointed and you're going to be frustrated. I mean, there are a lot of things that are very similar to, to oil meeting, or well, well, <laughs> there are a lot of components of oil painting that are similar to other mediums, but they're not identical. And I think for me, um, for example, I was used to working with a certain speed and a certain pressure when it came to brush strokes. And I didn't realize that with oil painting, like your brush basically has to barely touch the canvas, like especially when you're doing detailed work. Um, layer one and color blocking is a different issue, but when it comes time to refining it in the final layers, um, I was always like pressing down really hard with my brush and trying to create these broad strokes when in reality, you're almost like dusting on the color and you know, you have to be really, really tender with it. Oh, sorry, my camera cut off again. It's so annoying dealing with this. Um, <laughs> some of you may some of you may know this, but some of you don't. But I had some issues my last two times recording where my camera, my webcam would just freeze. But anyways, as I was saying, yeah, um, you really have to be very gentle with the amount of brush pressure you have. And also, one thing I noticed about oils is like with blending, it's not, it's not okay. Let me make an example. If I, if I was trying to blend something from black to white, if I was trying to make a smooth gradient, um, initially my thought process was, okay, I'll take some black and I'll take some white and I'll just kind of like blend it with my brush in between and I'll create a nice uh, gradient of grays. And that's not how blending works with oils at all. In fact, like most of the blending happens without you actually blending. Most of the blending happens from the colors that you mix and put onto your canvas. So color mixing is a lot more important than I gave it credit for initially. Um, if I was trying to blend from white to black, it's not enough to just have white and black. I need to make, I need to just mix all the different, um, values of grays and lot like brush the grays down next to each other and the only blending i do is blurring the edges between the two grays if that makes sense so you might think that like oh blending from white to black i only need two colors white and black and i can just kind of almost blend it on the canvas like no you actually have to blend it you have to mix the colors ahead of time and then lay the colors down next to each other so they're already looking very gradient and almost very polished and then you just use your brush to kind of fine tune it and, and give it the final um, blending blurry feel but most of the 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 illusion of blending or the illusion of like soft gradients and soft shadows happens from picking the right colors and putting them down putting them down in the right places so those are my two main oil painting lessons and it's still like even though i know this in my mind it's not something that i'm able to perfect like for example right now this eye i am working on um it's looking really flat and i have to go back and put some more shadows in and you know oh sorry this made me think of a third thing which is like oil painting is a lot of fine tuning um that's it's almost like sculpting where you start off with something rough and something very blocky and then you go in and carve out small details it's so similar to sculpting and i mean i've never sculpted but based on what i know and what i've seen it's it's just like that it's not you have to approach it from that mindset instead of expecting things to look perfect right away or even perfect halfway through um things won't really take shape until a lot later and you just have to kind of get over that mental hurdle um and kind of put up with it looking weird for a long time. So yeah. Next question is from Sarah F.E. And she asks, do you always find it easy to come up with ideas for paintings or do you have periods when you struggle with concepts? In that case, how do you ta tackle it? So definitely in the beginning, I went through periods where I needed to come up with an idea of how to paint and I didn't have any ideas. And I just sat there like wasting my time and struggling and, um, you know, just being unsure of what to do. So 
once I've, I've been through that situation so many times, so now I'm like more prepared for it. And what I do is whenever I have an idea, whether or not I have a painting coming up, um, if I have a cool idea, I write it down. And I've said this a lot in my video, so sorry if you've already heard me give this advice and it's redundant, but basically, yeah, whenever you have an idea, just write it down. You don't have to have a sketchbook or a journal. You can even write it down on your phone. You can write it in your notes app or I don't know, email it to yourself whatever method you choose and that way when it comes time for you to actually do a painting you have a whole book of ideas that you can pick and choose from um, even if the idea isn't good like even if I have the silliest idea ever I will still write it down because you don't have to always stick to literally the idea you wrote down word for word or the concept sketch that you scribble down like inch by inch. You can just use that idea as a starting point and have something else grow and evolve from it. And if you don't write it down, you let that moment pass. Um, most of the times I end up forgetting what I was thinking about. So just write it down. Even if you look back and laugh at yourself later, you might think of another concept that you like more that's semi-related, you know? So you never know. Um, so yeah, if I struggle with finding ideas, well, actually th lately I haven't been because I have so many, like I choose one out of 10 ideas that I actually write down to make into actual paintings. And that's because I just have so many of them and I have no filter or sensor when it comes to writing down ideas in my idea journal. Like some of them are just downright silly, but you know, I still do it. <sighs> okay, next question is from, oh, this is a really good one, <laughs> Jay Spire says, what is your artist statement? What are you trying to say to the world or audience through your art? Okay, so this actually reminds me, I really need to update the artist statement. <laughs> Currently my website, it's really old. Um, yeah, I've actually been thinking about that a lot lately, especially with my two solo shows coming up and kind of what I want to write down. Um, Cause for solo shows, you really should write down a little paragraph explaining not only your show, but also your, in general, your artist statement. Um, and I realized that one thing that I've always tried to do with my paintings was transplant the viewer of my painting into another world. And for a long time, I thought it was like a fantasy world. I, you know, I wanted it to be a fantasy world that was trippy and cool and like psychedelic and full of fantasy elements and, you know, like anti-gravity, anti-laws of physics. But I think lately also, um, I realized that I want my artwork to bring viewers a feeling of peace and tranquility and a calmness and a com comfortable feeling. So it's like not just, um, in some ways it's like I want people to feel at home, even though my environments are often surreal and not things you can find on earth, I still want people to have a sense of belonging and comfort the same way that you know, being at home would. And um, yeah, and, and that's why like the expressions that I put on my women, they're never sad. Like that's one thing I always try to avoid. Um, I'm not saying there's anything wrong if you like to paint girls who are sad. Like I think there's a lot of beauty in making women or making your subject feel a strong, passionate emotion. And that's something that I definitely am a fan of when, when I view art. Um, I love seeing strong emotion either way. But just for my personal style, um, I think I like having that amb ambiguous neutral expression because people can use it as a mirror of their own emotions and they can, they can assign an emotion to the subject based on their own experiences and their own outlook. And I think that's really cool. Um, I love hearing people's interpretation of my pieces, especially if the interpretation is different than what I had been aiming to accomplish. It's really cool to see my piece tell a story that I wasn't even aware of. I think that's really rewarding. So I've always wanted to just give a feeling of comfort and openness and peace in um, whatever piece I do. And then I love giving the viewer the freedom and space to interpret it however they want. So I guess that in a way is my, is my um, artist statement. Um, I know it's kind of broad because a lot of artists say this, but that's truly how I want my work to come across. and. Also, another thing is um, I love, obviously, surreal elements. And the thing that I love about surrealism, at least for me personally, is the way I react to it is emotions that aren't everyday emotions that I feel 
on a human spectrum. So how should I say this? So like there's there's a few basic human emotions that we all feel and all very familiar with. So like happiness, sadness, anger, frustration, inspiration, excitement, love, uh, heartbreak. You know, there's so many emotions that kind of we can all identify with and we can all label properly. But the thing I love about viewing and creating surrealist artwork is that you feel an emotion that you haven't really been taught and haven't really uh, been able to label or, or decipher. It's like you almost feel like an inhuman type of emotion. Like if I were to dream up alien species and the, the, the feelings they go through um, when they operate in a completely different world or dimension, um, I think that's what surrealism art does to me. It makes me feel something that I've never ever felt before and it's neither good nor bad. It's not sad or happy. Um, it's just so different and so uh, otherworldly and that's what kind of that's what's poignant to me that's what's um, that's what makes a piece of artwork stick in my brain and makes me react and I love that I love not knowing what I'm feeling just knowing that whatever I'm feeling is strong and it's different so that's something else that I try to achieve with my work and hopefully um, other people can also share in that joy <laughs> of of that kind of response. Okay, next question. I think this um, this might be my last question, or maybe maybe I'll have two more questions. But okay. Um, okay, so <laughs> Sarah Burns Studio asked a pretty good one. It's it's a very different vein than the first one I answered. Um, or the previous question I answered, but she asked, when you first started dealing with self-employment tax, filing business documents, etc., did you figure it out as you go or did you have someone help you? Um, I definitely hired someone to help me. She, um, she has been my accountant for many years. I love her, she's super cool. She did my taxes when I was um, not working in art, when I was working in tech. So, you know, it's just nice to have someone who's like a friend, who knows you, who knows your, your business, your goals. And yeah, I just, I keep hiring her every year to do my um, self-employment taxes as well. If you have any questions about taxes, I really don't have any answers because I'm so bad at it and that's why I hired someone else to do it for me. Um, and for me, it's money well spent because the, the possibility of like doing my taxes wrong or, you know, not getting enough returns or ending up paying more taxes like that risk um completely uh, like makes it worth just paying the money and hiring a professional to do it so i've never been good at doing taxes um i tried to do it on my own for the first few years that i worked full-time because it was kind of easy to do it um when i was working in a full-time job the same job every year um, you basically kind of get sent tax forms and you just fill it out. Well, at least I, I might have done that wrong. I don't know. But it seemed easy to me. Um, but then the second I switched jobs, I went through a year where half the year I worked at one job and the other half of the year I worked at another job. Like that was enough to confuse me and for me to just be like, no, just hire someone. So yes, I do hire someone to do my taxes. It's not because you know, I'm like fancy or anything. It's simply because I don't know how to do it properly and I would rather have the reassurance that someone who knows how to do it is taking care of it instead of me making a mistake um, or, you know, the worst thing, I could, like not getting enough tax return back or getting overcharged because of a mistake is obviously bad, but I think what's even worse is like, what if I get in trouble or like forget something or, I don't know, I would just hate that. So I definitely want someone professional taking care of it. And so I guess that would be my advice to you guys too. If you're actually, legitimately thinking of doing art as a business and you're worrying about how it's going to work with taxes and stuff um i recommend going to a professional and getting uh, getting help there so yeah okay i'll answer one more question since this one was kind of short um whew, there's so many questions i'm trying to okay so Alyssa Anderson asks, what are your thoughts on abstract art? I hear a lot of mixed opinions in the art community and I find it very interesting. Some say it is not real art, but what is real art anyway? I'm curious to know your opinions on the topic. Really good question. Um, so I think there's a lot of different kinds of abstract art, just as there's a lot of types of 
realistic art or fantasy art. So it really depends on your personal taste. Um, in terms of what the art community feels or the general consensus, I really don't listen to that or care about that because I think the great thing about art is it's so subjective and you have the freedom to react to it however you want and I respect all opinions. You know, a lot of people who, who love modern abstract art might not like my work because it's too, I don't know, fairy tale or whatever. Um, and that's fine. I respect everyone's opinion. Um, my personal opinion, I'm not, obviously, <laughs> you can tell from the type of art I like to create, I'm not as big of a fan of abstract art. That being said though, um, there are a few that I really loved and responded to, but the ones that I love tend to be a lot more detailed and fleshed out than I guess maybe what you're thinking of when you're asking this question. I think you're you're more asking of those like really modern, really simple art, kind of like, like Jackson Pollock or um, Rothko, you know, things that are just very like beautiful and decorative like they would look really good hanging up on a wall in my opinion but for me it's hard for me to have an emotional reaction to something so simple and almost very design rooted in design rather than rooted in like fine art or painting okay i don't want to say it's not rooted in fine art because i have a lot of respect for every artist no matter what genre you are but um yeah just out of personal preference, no strings attached, no ulterior motive for me expressing this. I just simply prefer more detailed art. You know, like when I go to the art museum, I love looking at the um, the Romantic period or the Baroque period paintings, like, you know, things done by like Da Vinci or even Impressionist paintings like Van Gogh. Um, I love things that are colorful and vivid and usually I like I like paintings that have human subjects, but that's not a requirement. Um, I'm a huge fan of JMW Turner who specializes in seascapes and a lot of his stuff especially later in his life became oh I dropped my brush a lot of his stuff became really abstracted but I think there's a difference between like that kind of abstraction where it's almost like an impressionist abstraction and um, the kind of abstraction where it's, it's just very very modern and, and minimal um, I think there's redeeming qualities to those types of artworks too because like I said they look they they look really good on a wall so you know if you're into like interior decor like my boyfriend for example loves modern art and loves like if we were to decorate our house with um pieces for like the living room or whatever he'd love like a modern abstract painting and just ties the whole space together and um you know obviously i don't let him do that because i i occupy now all of our wall space with my own art but um yeah, what was I saying? Oh yeah, but I think like also you can have a a strong. It's definitely possible to have a strong emotional reaction to abstract art because because it is so simple and so minimal. It definitely creates this open space of possibility where anyone can react to it in any way possible. So I I know I know the I can see the intention behind it and I can see the the expressiveness behind it. It's just personally not my favorite. You know, as an artist, I love all all sorts of art and I love challenging myself and viewing different types of art to try to open my mind. But yeah, I I typically enjoy the type of art that I also like to create, which is pop surrealism, things with fairy tale narrative elements, things with women or human subjects, things with surreal elements, things that are detailed and rendered very realistically so I can almost fully um, get lost in that world and convince myself I am in that world. Um, but yeah, I don't have any like strong feelings of hatred towards abstract art. It's just not my favorite. Um, but yeah, I hope that answers your question. <laughs> okay, let me check on the time real quick. Okay, I think I'm going to answer one more question. Um, we're going to go a little bit over an hour, but oh well. I've thoroughly enjoyed this and um, you guys deserve it. So I'll, I'll answer one more question and there are a lot that I didn't answer, but I'll save those for episode four. Um, so the last question of the day is from Pathulu and she or he asks, when you photograph your paintings, how do you avoid light reflecting off of the glossy areas of your painting or do you Photoshop those areas later? So this is actually, um, first of all, I think, um, I forgot where I learned this. I think probably just from an online tutorial or um, research or just trial and error, but 
uh, photograph things in the daylight, but in the shade. So don't photo don't put them in the sun, and don't photograph them from an unnatural light source, um, like like an overhead light or anything like that. I like to just take my paintings out just outside my door on the balcony or wherever, um, or even inside my my studio next to a window, but in the shade. So there's no direct light on it, and um, I like to have one source of light coming from right above the painting. That being said, occasionally you'll notice that the top of your painting is going to be a little bit brighter than the bottom because obviously it's closer to the light source. And in those cases, yeah, I do use Photoshop. I use the burn tool on Photoshop to just darken the areas that are too bright or brighten the areas that are too dark. Um, but recently, this is so interesting, and this is something I learned from my really good friend Lena Danya. A lot of you guys might know her. Um, she's amazing. And I... Um, yeah, I, I asked her one day, I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm so, I'm so frustrated because I filmed like hours and hours of this painting time lapse, but there's this weird reflective glare and you can't even see the progress of the painting because all you're seeing is like the shiny wet reflection. And uh, she gave me a really good pro tip and that is like you want your light source and your camera angle to be pointing at the same direction. So if my camera is like right here, I'll have a light that shines like this towards my my canvas and no other light because any other light would would give a glare and I didn't even know that and when she told me that it like literally changed my life so nowadays none of my time lapses will have a glare um, so thank you so much Lena you saved my ass and you're an awesome sexy person and I love you <laughs> so yeah that is my tip for photographing or filming paintings is um, daylight in the shade um, don't be afraid to use Photoshop to correct a few areas and also Lena's tip, which is have your try to have your light source and your camera pointing the same angle towards your painting. And I think that would really help. OK, so I didn't really get to finish this face, um, but I really have to cut this video short. I think we're over time. Um, so let me just stop my time lapse here and say my goodbyes. So it has been really great to have you guys with me for Art and Chat episode 3. I appreciate you taking the time to paint along with me or even watch this video. Um, either way, it's an hour of your life and I'm honored to have shared it with you. And I hope you guys have a wonderful day. Happy painting. I wish you productivity and creativity and health and energy. <laughs> so um, until next time, have a great day and I hope to see you in the next video. Bye!